Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. Congressman Jerry Costello decided to retire after 24 years in Congress. Mr. Costello, a Democrat, has been a Southern Illinois Congressman since August of 1988 when he won a special election to replace the late Melvin Price. Congressman Price and Congressman Costello are the only two to hold that seat since the end of World War II. According to the left-leaning Daily Kos online blog, Mr. Costello's seat might be filled by a conservative. Our guest today, Republican Jason Plummer of O'Fallon, Illinois, hopes to be that conservative. He's a Republican Party's nominee. Currently, he serves as Vice President of Corporate Development at R.P. Lumber Company, a family-owned and operated business. He's also a United States Reserve Naval Intelligence Officer. His unit is stationed at Scott Air Force Base. Today we will be discussing what he hopes to accomplish as the next congressman from the 12th district. Jason Plummer, welcome to Conversation. Thanks, Lee. It's good to be back. I'm glad to have you. We're always glad to right. have you right. here. Um, let's just assume the close here. All right, you've won. You're, you're now going to replace Jerry Costello. Okay, let's just assume okay. that. So now it's January of uh, 2013. The country is now, as everybody knows, in a heck of a mess. Um, unemployment while officially right now here we are today is July the 10th uh, is still 8.2 percent I don't know what it's going to be in November or January of next year but it's not going to be too much different from where it is right now and they say that unemployment is actually closer to 14 percent when you add in all the people who have given up looking for a job what is it that you intend to do to make things better for Illinois? Well, we have a lot of problems nationally, and I, I would argue that the folks within the state of Illinois are facing headwinds from both Washington and from Springfield. We kind of have a couple problems in our state government and our national government. Uh, the 12th Congressional District of Illinois makes up part or all of 12 counties, and some of the counties in my congressional district are some of the, the, the worst off counties in the state of Illinois. We've got some of the highest unemployment rates. It's really tragic if you look at what's happened. Um, are some of those coal counties? A lot of them are coal counties, absolutely. You know, uh, you get into, you know, Franklin County, Alexander County, uh, those, those counties are really struggling and others. And, you know, if you look at, as you're alluding to with coal, if you look at Southern Illinois, we're tremendously blessed with resources. We have a tremendous amount of coal, oil, gas, our geographic location with our access to road, rail, river, air infrastructure is, is phenomenal. We've got a good hard working workforce. We've got uh, Scott Air Force Base kind of to the north. We've got SIU Carbondale to the south, which are great anchors for our economy. But unfortunately, with all these assets, with all these wonderful human resources, we still are uh, really struggling economically. And, and the reason why is because of poor public policy. So I think we need to send people to Washington, and for that matter, to Springfield. But I'm obviously running to go to Washington. We need to send people to Washington that are focused on proper public policy to get people back to work, to, to, to get the burden of government off the backs of small businessmen and, and our workers. And so so I would be really focused on a lot of fiscal and economic issues. I, I think we need to shrink the size and the scope of the federal government. And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of people say, you know, what issue are you most passionate about? Is it, you know, people know I'm pro-life, people know I'm for the Second Amendment. You know, are those the issues you're most passionate about? Or is it low tax? Is it less spending? What is it? And I say all the time, you know, it's about shrinking the size and scope of the federal government. We have to get government out of our lives. Uh, we've got to get government off the backs of our small businessmen. We've got to allow coal miners to mine coal. We've got to allow farmers to farm fields. We've got to allow small businessmen to create jobs. Uh, we shouldn't have government involved in health care decisions to the degree that they're now involved. Uh, they shouldn't be impacting uh, a lot of our, our social service providers, especially the religious-based institutions. And if we get government uh, out of the way of those things. If we allow the people of Southern Illinois, which I talk about all the time, just to do what they do best, uh, good things will happen, we'll turn this economy around. But right now, with the bureaucracy, the burdensome taxes, the regulations, we're not gonna be able to turn this around. Now, my next question I know is a hot button issue. Many of the people, especially the coal people, are going to see this as hot button. I'm gonna say three letters, E-P-A. <laughs> um, 
back, I believe it was in the year 2007, the uh, Environmental uh, Protection Agency, which was created, I, I don't know, that people recognize this, was only created in the uh, 1970s. I believe it might have been in 1970 that it was created. Um, and, but in 2007, they passed a new rule. They ruled. <laughs> and they said that uh, carbon dioxide, which I am expelling right now, and every other human being and animal does all the time, uh, comes within their purview of regulation, and therefore they have more to say about uh, coal right. and other materials in our economy. Right. Uh, would you like to comment on that? I'm sure you would. But well, go ahead. the EPA is a big problem, especially you talk to anyone involved with well, coal. Well, as a congressman, what do you want to do with the EPA other than just say, well, let's disband it. Well, right, and, and you have a lot of people say, well, I'm gonna get rid of this, get rid of that. And I, I think you really need some sober, sincere people that are seriously trying to figure out how to solve these problems. So you take in, you know, the EPA, and they're just one of many examples. We could take you know, a lot of other bureaucracies that exist. You know, the EPA has now over 18,000 employees. And does the EPA provide some core functions that are necessary? Sure, absolutely. But now that you have 18,000 bureaucrats, it's grown beyond the original intents and purposes of why it was created, as you said, 40 years ago or so. And so now you say, these 18,000 people have to justify their existence. And they justify their existence by creating more rules and more regulations. And those rules and regulations put our coal miners out of work. They, they hurt our farmers. I mean, the EPA literally has tried to um, regulate how much dust a combine can kick up on a farm field. They've tried to uh, outlaw 15-year-old uh, kids working on their family farm. I mean, Southern Illinois is all about 13 and 14 and 15 year old kids working on family farms. It's about coal miners. It's about the oil and gas um, drillers. It's about those people who are out there tapping our natural resources and growing our economy. And this EPA, with this administration and their Democrat allies in the House and the Senate, are putting these industries out of business. And that pause there for a second. Remember, I just said 2007. Who was the administration in 2007? Well, if you look at 2007 and if you look at the expansion we've had now, it, it's gone out of control. And in 2007, we had the White House, but we lost control, as you well know, of the, the um, legislate, legislative bodies. But we of mean government. the Democrat Party, is that right? Well, the Republican Party I'm, lost control. I'm sorry, control. the, re the right. Republican Party lost control right, absolutely. in January of 2007. Correct, yes, after right. the 06 elections. And so what we've really seen over the last few years, an expansion of these bureaucracies, an expansion of government like we've never seen before, and it's really harming our industries. Okay, so um, here, I could get on my soapbox right now sure. and talk about, uh, and, and I don't want to, this is your time, this is your time to tell people what it is that you want to do as a United States Congressman. There, there are many duties that the United States Congress has, and there are many things that they do that it's not even in the rule book, but they decide to uh, get into it anyway. Right. I mean, the rule book is the United States uh, Constitution. Constitution. It says right in there right. what can and can't be done. Would you, are you uh, in a position to discuss your feelings about what's called the Commerce Clause? Sure. You, you want to talk about that so that people have, because it's been talked about quite a bit because of the Supreme, the, Court, uh, ruling. Supreme Court ruling on the Affordable Care Act. It's right. no longer Obamacare, it's right. the Affordable, Air, and the it's, Affordable Care it's Act. It's no longer a penalty, it's now a tax too. Yeah. The, well, <laughs> so, depend uh, on who you talk to. Right, right, depending on who you talk to. Uh, one thing on the EPA, you know, you said, what do you specifically do? Yes. And I think that's a perfect example of what you're talking about now with the expansion of government. And that's why when I said, you know, my passion is shrinking the size and scope of the federal government. You take Congressman John Chimkus, for example, economically, demographically, culturally, his district is not too dissimilar to the district that, that I'm running in here. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the way he has tackled the EPA with the help of, of some other elected officials, and he has stood up for the farmers and the coal miners of his district, he's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of these bureaucracies. You can have a congressman fighting for his constituencies. John Shimkus has done a good job of that. I, I definitely would like to replicate that as well, and that would be my goal. In terms of the Commerce Clause, and I would say the expansion of government around uh, that issue as well as you know the constitution and everything else i mean government is grown beyond all the original intents and purposes of our founding fathers the constitution um you know it, it seems like it's almost being ignored in a lot of ways these days it's very frustrating if you look at the czars we have if you look at the new agencies that are being created if you look at the powers that are being granted to non-legislative bodies i'm missing that in the constitution i don't remember reading about czars right and, uh, czars Caesar. I mean, that's where the term czar comes from. It's, you know, they used to say Caesar. Caesar was a dictator. Right. 
an right. emperor. Uh, and it seems to me that in America we are developing a whole series of emperors or little emperors and that the president, and I'm not just referring to this president, I'm referring to presidents for the last quarter century, have become more um, oriented to just writing a rule through uh, uh, a presidential executive edict. Executive orders. Yeah, well, an right. pre executive order, but it's a presidential edict. Right. Well, and, and if you look and, at me... Uh, you guys in Congress need to rebalance this. Well, and we need to, and we have to try to, but, you know, you have to get enough people that respect the Constitution and are focused on the constitutional foundation of our nation in Washington, D.C., fighting for those rights. I mean, you're right. You see not just the creation of czars and things of that nature, but you see a lot of things that would have gone through the legislative bodies in the past are now going around the legislative bodies. The House, the U.S. House of Representatives, is supposed to control the purse strings. But we have some of these bodies that are not responsible to the Senate, that are not responsible to the House, that have budgets that are literally billions and billions and billions of dollars. And to me, that's very frightening. What happened to the House controlling the spending. So you're absolutely right. We need to get back to the core functions of government. We need to get back to the processes that our founding fathers put in place. And, you know, I, I think one thing that we can say Obamacare has done as a positive for our nation is it has gotten a lot of people back talking about the Constitution, talking about what are those core functions of government, talking about um, the correct procedure for passing legislation, for what is a court's rule? You know, is, is a court supposed to be creating legislation or is a court supposed to be ruling on legislation? So you have a lot of American people that over the last couple of years have gone through another lesson in civics and uh, I think a lot of Americans have had their eyes opened uh, to the benefit of the nation because they, they realize how government has grown and, and how a lot of our elected officials have neglected the way things should be done. Right now, the United States, and not just this month, mm -hmm. but for the many, many months in the past and many months into the future, we're spending 100 to $150 billion each month more than the government is taking in. Okay. S having said that mm -hmm. and sinking further into debt every single month, as a congressman, what would you want to do about that situation? Well, we, uh, we have to get our fiscal house in order. I, I think we need to send more people to Washington that understand uh, how their rules and their laws positively or negatively impact the economy. And the economy is key to this because we talk about deficits, we talk about our debt. One way to, to, um, to get rid of our deficits, one way to start killing that debt is to grow our economy. When we grow our economy, when we put more people back to work, we actually grow the tax revenues to Washington. And as long as we have elected officials in Washington that properly use those tax revenues to, to pay down our, our debt and to get rid of our deficits, we can turn around the, the fiscal situation that our nation's in right now. But unfortunately, we have a lot of people that, you know, they spend money like crazy and they spend money because it's not their money. And we need to send more people to Washington to look at those tax monies as uh, an obligation to be spent prud prudently. And uh, I, I just don't see it right now. So how, how, do we, how do we go about doing that? You know, we need more folks in Washington to understand how to balance budgets. We need to send more people to Washington that I always say like to sign, have known how to sign the front end of a check, not just endorse the back. We've got a whole lot of lawyers in Washington, D.C. We've got a whole lot of bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. We've got a whole lot of career politicians in Washington, D.C. I think we need to send some businessmen to Washington. I think we need to send some people that have some fiscal background in Washington, D.C. so that we can promote positive public um, policy and get this economy turned around. That's the way we're going to solve the fiscal crisis we're in right now. Uh, the unemployment rate being 8.2%, as you alluded to, if we were using the same numbers and the same formulas that they use historically, if you look at the underemployed, if you look at the people that have quit looking for work, it's probably more like 14.8.9%. That's a ridiculous unemployment rate. We have to be adding 150,000 jobs a month just to keep up with population growth. And we added, what, 80,000 jobs, I think, last month. So. Not only are we not putting people back to work that are looking for work, we're actually growing the number of people unemployed just because of population trends. So this president has, has decimated this economy. His allies in the House and the Senate have decimated this economy, and we've got to get this thing turned around because it's not just a fiscal problem we're facing, Lee. It's also a national security problem as we've discussed in the past. I mean, these debts and these deficits that we keep racking up, they're harming our military, they're harming our national security. We're turning, you know, a lot of foreign nations are buying up our debt. We're not being able to spend the type of money that we should spend on programs the government should be spending money on, national defense. It's, it's very frustrating. Well, that was something I was going to, <coughs> that was something I was going to get into, is that um, there are certain functions that governments are supposed to work on, 
and then there are other nice to have functions right. but the nice to haves seem to be eating up a huge portion of the uh, of the budget right now uh, perhaps as much as the entire deficit uh, the 1.2 to 1.8 trillion dollars in deficit that we're running up every year now appears to be in the nice to have category uh, I mean the uh, and when I say the must-haves that would first be military right. and then after that, then it would be things like, you know, maintaining roads. Right. Uh, in the Constitution, it actually mentions the post office. Right, the infrastructure. Yes, right. infrastructure, which seems to get, you know, short shrift. Uh, it's uh, just not that many days ago they passed, finally, a transportation bill, which is severely underfunded. There are many, I mean, the president speaks all the time about aging roads that are falling apart. It's not quite that bad, but, you know, roads that need to be improved. And there's not enough money that's being put in there because we're spending so much money on paying individuals in the economy as opposed to paying for social structures that are for everybody. Well, you know, a, a lot of the problems we face, too, and I'm running as a Republican, but, you know, I'm the first to admit the Republican Party has done good things and it's done bad things. You know, a lot of these problems we're facing, they're not Democrat problems, they're not Republican problems, they're American problems. And I think anybody, I don't care, you know, if you're liberal, conservative, young, old, Republican, Democrat, whatever you are, if you look at what's happened in the last year or so, when we had a bunch of politicians that were assigned to duty, you guys have to figure out where to cut this money from the budget, and if you don't figure out where to cut this money from the budget, we're going to whack a half a trillion dollars from the Pentagon. I think the last thing we need to be doing right now is whacking a half a trillion dollars from the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. I'm an intelligence officer in the Navy Reserves. There's a lot of things going on in this world. The, our, role, our, our number one role of government is to protect its citizens, to protect our national interests. And where you're whacking a half a trillion dollars from our men and women in uniform simply because a bunch of career politicians of both parties can't get together and solve a problem, I think that shows you how messed up Washington, D.C. is and why we need fresh blood in Washington. Yeah, yeah. Before we started, I told you I was going to ask you this question. I saw and have been seeing a series of articles in various news outlets about uh, NASA and the American Space Program. Right. And in uh, the July 9th, I think it was the 9th or the 8th, uh, edition of the Wall Street Journal, there was this big article about NASA and how they don't seem to carry much weight in the world anymore. That uh, that it used to be that NASA would set the priorities around the world outside of the Soviet Union right. as to what we were going to be doing as a world in outer space. And now they can't seem to, well first of all NASA has kind of pulled the rug out uh, when they were, they said, they told people they were going in a certain direction and then all of a sudden they said, oh, sorry, we're not going to do that. Right. And so the Indians, the Chinese, the Japanese, and others, believe it or not, uh, are even the Iranians right. have their own space program. There seems to be a real lack of coordination. Do you have any comments about this? Well, I, I think... You know, if you look back in history, especially post-World War II, I mean, America was always kind of the tip of the spear of, technolog of technology, of business, of freedom, of everything you can think of. And obviously, the space program played a huge role in that. I, I, you know, why has America's military always been so strong? Well, first off, we have great people in the military. Mm -hmm. Second off, it got the funding that it needed. And third off, I would argue that we were technologically advanced. You know, I mean, our GPS system was, was second to none. You know, I mean, if you look at what we've done historically, Historically, well, the space program uh, was key to a lot of that, and, and I would argue to the next person. I mean, space is you know truly the the next frontier, and you know you've got the Chinese exploring, you've got the Russians doing things. As you said, you've got countries like Iran and India creating space programs. The fact of the matter is, America has to compete. We should be the ones out there in space. We should be the ones controlling that frontier. You control space, you control a whole lot. And that's, you know, that's not just a scientific standpoint, that's from a military standpoint, that's from you know, a, a national defense standpoint. We have to control what's going on in space. And you're right, the, uh, NASA and our space program is getting a little bit shortchanged uh, because of budget issues, and, and that's something that needs to be addressed. I, I view the space program not as a, a, obviously there's a lot of scientific benefits but I look at it from a national security perspective, and, and people need to seriously look at it in that regard. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I go back far enough. I remember, I think it was fourth grade, they herded us all into the auditorium where TVs were all set up, and there was Alan Shepard, the very right. first American to go into space, you know? And so, and I saw every single one of those guys 
from the uh, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs and into the space shuttle program go up. And the promise when I was a kid and, and a young adult was, Americans were going to stand on, the, on Mars during your lifetime. Right. And I don't believe that's going to be the case. Anymore. Maybe a Chinese man or woman <laughs> might be standing on Mars in my lifetime, but I don't think America will be based upon where we stand now. As a congressman, I hope that you understand that it's not just about, you know, people think they're sending money into space. They're not. It goes to Boeing. It goes to GE. It goes to all these other companies that are building portions of this military industrial complex. Well, you know, you're right in a lot of regards there. But I think at the end of the day, you know, the space program, what we did, it was about that American exceptionalism. We could do anything we set our sights on. You know, and I think that that's what, you know, it's been ingrained in us since we were children. America is the best. We can do whatever we want. If you work hard, you can achieve. I don't care if we're talking about the space program or if we're talking about somebody that wants to open a, a cafe or someone that wants to, you know, create their own business, whatever. In America, you can do what you want because we're a nation of freedoms. We're a nation of opportunity. And what I've seen the last few years is frightening. And when I talk to people in the streets, I've done town halls and meet and greets in the counties within the district. I met with a lot of people, Republicans, Democrats, Independents. They don't see that sense of, of exceptionalism anymore. They don't listen to the president and they're not inspired like they were with Ronald Reagan, where you can do anything you set your, your, your eyes on. Mm -hmm. You can get out there and achieve. America can do it. And instead, you know, we've got elected officials that wanna, wanna I think, equate us to Europeans and equate us to all these other folks and, and you know, we want, we want to be like the French are in this regard, or we want to be like we are, like the Canadians are in this regard. No, I want America to be the best. I want America to be the best in everything we can. I think our people can achieve it, and I know our people want to do it, but we have to have leadership. We have to have a sense of optimism from our elected officials. And right now, uh, all I get from elected officials, and I think all a lot of people get from elected officials is, well, you know, the government will take care of that. The government will do that. And, you know, the government hasn't been the one on the cutting edge of all these advances. These are scientific advancements that we've seen from the private sector that has grown uh, our economy and it's it's enabled our country to achieve everything it's achieved and we need that sense of American exceptionalism we need that sense of opportunity that people felt 10 20 30 years ago that they don't feel anymore mm -hmm. well, what you just said was seems to be the very opposite though of bringing home the bacon you know what I'm talking about sure. where, as sure at, at, where there are many congressmen or senators uh, I'm thinking now of Robert Byrd that they right. say basically moved huge ports of Washington right. into West Virginia into his state because you know he he was one of the senior senators um, that is part of the past uh, are, are you going to be working on you know setting up stuff for southern Illinois so that they enjoy the benefits and wind up having borrowed Chinese money coming to them or are we going to look at larger issues of this is America, the very things that you were talking right. about that we need to restructure and reset up so that we're back in business. Well, it, it's not about building dependency. The people of Southern Illinois shouldn't, and they don't need to be dependent on Washington, D.C. They don't, you know, that, that's not, you're talking about the earmarking process, essentially, and congressmen trying to get as much of the pot as they can, take it home to their district so they can spread it around and, and get reelected. And, you know, I always chuckle at these politicians. It happens at the state level, it happens at the federal level, that bring home taxpayer money and, and spread it around as if it's their own money, and they name things after themselves and things like that. It's frustrating. I think it's insulting to taxpayers everywhere. Um, but you know, not every earmark's a bad earmark. Um, you know, if you're bringing home, I told people, you know, when I was at the Heritage Foundation in 05, I even wrote a, a paper on some of the earmarks that had taken place. I remember writing about a indoor rainforest in Iowa and, and some of these other, you know, the bridge to nowhere, everyone's heard about that. Now that's just simply a political spending on behalf of a person. But I mean, what about Scott Air Force Base? Scott Air Force Base, it's great for the local economy, but it provides an important role in national security. And I think Scott does a phenomenal mm -hmm. job. We need to make sure that Scott uh, stays how it is and then grows. We need to see Scott continue to grow because my Navy unit's based at Scott Air Force Base. I understand how great of a job Scott does in its functions in national security. And it's just, we're very fortunate to have it here in the district and I'm gonna do everything I can to grow Scott Air Force Base. You know, you talked about infrastructure. Our farmers, our coal miners have to make sure that their product can get to the global marketplace. You know, farmers and, and coal miners shouldn't be responsible for, for building all the roads and levees and locks and dams to get their product to, to the river and down 
down to the Gulf and out into the global marketplace. That's an infrastructural role, like you referred to earlier, the government should be providing. But no, I mean, are, you know, you have to have people that understand the, the cost-benefit analysis of federal spending. And if you're making an expenditure that um, positively impacts national security, that positively impacts the economy, that grows the economy, that's a great thing. If you're running around just trying to spend money so you can act like Robin Hood, uh, you're, you're being a, a, a poor leader. You're, you're, I think, quite frankly, insulting your, your constituents because um, the people of Southern Illinois are hard workers. We're blessed with natural resources. We just need government out of the way, and that's how we grow this economy. Mm -hmm. I am passionate about this race because I think the people of Southern Illinois have been uh, essentially neglected for a very long, long time by those in Springfield and by Washington, D.C. They've taken away our coal mining jobs. They've taken away our manufacturing jobs. They've taken away our transportation jobs. Our agricultural providers are under assault. Now they're taking away the state jobs in Southern Illinois. And me, I want to get government out of the way. I believe in Southern Illinois because I believe in the people of Southern Illinois. They're great people with great resources, and we've got to provide them the opportunity to provide for their families. Mm -hmm. We've got about two or three minutes left. Sure. Uh, is there any other area that you wanted to make sure that you said something to the people listening? Well, I just, you know, um, I encourage people to, to watch these programs. You do a great job of getting a variety of viewpoints out there, and you know I think that's great. I think we need more elected officials that are willing to go out and engage the public. We've got a lot of people that don't want to say where they stand on issues. We've got a lot of people that you know they avoid getting out there in the public because, quite frankly, they don't represent what the public believes in. I encourage people, you know, to go to my website, jasonplumber.com, and look at us on the website. You know, it's jasonplumber.com. You can go to our Facebook. You can go to our Twitter. We engage the public, and we let the public engage us. You know, we're trying to get debates with my opponents. Right now, there's 12 or 15 debate offers. We've accepted every single one. I think my opponents accepted one in late September. That's an insult to the people. The now, pe you've had some problems having, finding an opponent, haven't <laughs> you? I mean, just talk a little bit about that just so yeah. people know what's going on. Well, it, it, the people of Southern Illinois have been neglected for a long time, and the, pro the way that this process was handled, I think, was an insult. I mean, I had an opponent, a very nice gentleman. He, he dropped out of the race. And Due then, to health issues. Right. And then uh, for four or five weeks, we went without an opponent. And then suddenly, you know, a couple county chairmen get together and they handpick the person that's going to represent all these people in Southern Illinois. Well, that's not democracy. That's not the way the system was created. It's an insult. And just like the person that he selected, my current opponent, we can't get him to debate us. We can't get him to show up to do media things. We can't get him to tell us where he stands on important positions of the day. That's an insult to the people. The people, need, they want to be able to touch and feel and understand where their elected officials are going to stand. And with Jason Plummer, they have that opportunity. With my opponent right now, he won't answer their questions. And right now, with the economy and the position it's in, with some of the things going on abroad, with some of the foreign policy issues that are taking place, people deserve and people have the right to know where their elected officials stand. Well, we've just about run out of time. And you did it. You came right in on time. Thank you very much <laughs> for, uh, for... I appreciate, one, you showing up and what you did say there about there are many people that I invite to come on this program that just say, nope. Won't right. do it. Just won't, especially in business, not just in the political realm. Sure. They don't want to be exposed. I appreciate the fact that at least you're willing to come here and answer some questions. No, anytime. Thank you very much, and we got to go. Thanks, Lee. You're very welcome. And uh, to the audience, I've been speaking with Jason Plummer. He's candidate for Congress in the 12th district to replace Jerry Costello. Got to go. See you next time.